This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Creota Wilberg. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Gene, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, we have the pleasure of talking with Creota Wilberg. Her new book, Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists, came out last month. And we had a really nice time talking with Creota about this text, which is quite healthful. <laughs> and for good reason. <laughs> It's helpful. It's it's a, it's a how to book, but it's more it's it's much more than a how to book. It's kind of a how to live book for artists. And but again, a lot of the a lot of the information here is applicable to you, even if you're not a cartoonist. That's right. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website dcbservice.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off at the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off at the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but every now and again, you can find discounts that go higher than that. Yeah, this month, uh, DCB Service has six different DC bundles for you to choose from, uh, anywhere from DC Kids to uh, the New Age of DC Heroes, uh, plus more. Uh, there's uh, two Marvel bundles as well, and even a Valiant bundle. And again, those are all at least 45% off. In fact, they're all 50% off except for the DC Universe, New Universe, New Variant Edition bundle. There's too many words there. I can't say all those words. Yeah. Well, you know why? It's because there's so many great discounts at Discount Comic Book Service. Exactly. It's just more than we can talk about. Be sure to go to DCBService.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. Go buy books. <laughs> books are good. You know, Gene, this was an interesting conversation with Creota, and, uh, you know, she definitely knows her stuff. Plus, she is, in many ways, especially as a creator, a renaissance person. Oh, yeah, definitely. Again, I've been – she's been one of my favorite mini-comics creators for years now because she is able – and you'll hear – again, you'll hear this in the interview. Her interests range very far and wide. Uh, she's the cartooning is one of her strengths, but with her medical background uh, in massage therapy and things like that, she's able to apply and kind of mix things together. And so her comics become it. I don't want to call them educational, even though they are, but they're they are really unlike any anything that I've ever seen anybody else do. Well, let's go ahead and listen to that conversation now. pleased to have on the Comics Alternative, Creota Wilberg, her new book, Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists, came out last month from Uncivilized Books. Creota, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy we've got you here, Creota. Um, uh, I'll just give a, the, t the tiniest bit of background first. I think I met you first probably at a Mocha Fest, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. 10 ish, uh, because I saw these books on your table, and one of them was The Pictorial Anatomy of 007, I believe it was called. Yes, that was probably seven years ago. Okay. Yeah. And I looked at this book and I flipped through it and I saw all these iconic moments from James Bond movies, but parts of his skin had been removed so we could see the musculature underneath. <laughs> and I was like, 
what the hell am I looking at? I have to own this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you so, and three other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, and then the, the more I've been following your career, I'm really happy that you've got an actual book book out now uh, so that hopefully your stuff can get out there to a wider audience. Uh, but I've been following your career and looking how you uh, juggle comics and medicine, balance ju- comics and medicine and education and needlework and all these different things. I just, I, I, I guess I want to say, first of all, thanks for all this uh, amazing stuff. Thanks for opening your brain in this many different ways for us. But uh, what can you tell us about uh, the genesis of Draw Stronger, first of all? Sure. Um, well, I have been a massage therapist for over 30 years now, um, which wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. (laughs) And I was uh, a guest faculty at the Center for Cartoon Studies one year, and my students would draw with their sketchbooks in their laps, like kind of curled into a little fetal ball. even if there was a table or a drawing horse or an easel or some other kind of like drawing structure around for them to use. Um, The default position seemed to be like small book in lap and then a lot of hunching. And some of these students were people who I suspect had not been drawing eight hours a day every day. (laughs) Um, And I was really... Uh, Yeah, before then. So I was really concerned about um, soft tissue injuries and repetitive stress injuries because um, as a massage therapist, I've specialized in orthopedic injury. And so my day job is, you know, addressing repetitive stress injuries in a variety of different contexts day in and day out. So I got online to see if I could find resources for cartoonists and artists that were about injury prevention that had the kind of detail and scope I wanted. Um, And I couldn't find, I couldn't find a single source that I liked and I couldn't even find like two sources that I felt like um, provided the context that I wanted the students to have. So um, yeah, I wrote the book. (laughs) (laughs) I started out by writing a 60 page mini comic, no pain um, for the students that really gave like some of the like immediate basics, the things that I really felt like they needed. Um, And then over the next couple of years, I added um, first aid for drawing injuries. And then I also started working on um, a 40 page mini comic about back pain to supplement everything. And then at that point, as I was starting to work on that, I was also starting to look for a publisher because stapling 60 pages is really really hard on your hands. Yeah. (laughs) And you should need to read your your own book. Yeah. So so as a form of preventative care, I decided a publisher would be the healthiest option I could get. That's excellent. Um, Yeah. So uh, I, I talked to Heidi McDonald at the beat and I asked her um, who she thought might be a good match in terms of publishers. And she recommended uncivilized books and Tom Kaczynski. And she was right. It was the, the first publisher I went to and he was interested and it just totally worked out and they've been great to work with. So I got very lucky. What Uh, was it about uncivilized that seemed to uh, suit uh, your work so well or, uh, or vice versa? I think Heidi, well, Heidi knows Uncivilized well. I think she knows that Tom has an interest in the comics community, um, kind of serving the community in a number of different ways. Uh, So um, kind of he's very interested in what I would actually call like a cartoonist's cartoonist. Does that make sense in a way? I think so. Yeah. Like he he publishes a lot of very smart work um, that I think is also like of interest to other cartoonists as well and kind of like serves um, serves as um, a point for discussion and um, kind of 
almost a survey in some ways of like how different cartoonists are working. Um, and then I think Heidi just also knows magical things about Tom that I do not know. And she's <laughs> a good, a good um, match. So, so yeah. Uh, and it, and it worked out, which was also really great. It's been very easy. And uh, I was very pleased. And in fact, I was curious about the choice of publisher. I mean, I absolutely love the stuff that Tom Kaczynski does. Everything he puts out through Uncivilized Books, you're right. It's very intelligent, very well done, not only in terms of the interior, but also the design and the packaging. So you really can't go wrong with Uncivilized Books. Yet given the topic of your comic here, Draw Stronger – um, you know, one could describe this as a kind of graphic medicine, which is a term that many people are using now in the comics yeah. community when it comes to comics that deal with health in some form or another. And I know that a few years ago, Penn State started its own series of graphic medicine, and they've come out with a variety of texts that deal with illnesses, wellness in one form or another. Um and I don't know, I just would have thought that something like Draw Stronger would find a home maybe there before Uncivilized, because it, before I knew that you were right. being published through Uncivilized, I wouldn't have even thought of Uncivilized, just given the topic of your, your text. Sure, sure. Um, the thing about uh, Penn Press is that the, so their graphic mat- medicine imprint um, has a lot more to do with like um, narratives of illness and narratives of health. Mm-hmm. So they're not necessarily like serving as, I mean, certainly they can be educational, but they're not like laying out like facts about do this, do that, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like they're more about narratives, narratives of health and illness. They're not into the prescriptive, right? Right, they're not they're not prescriptive, and also um, let's face it, uh, injury prevention for cartoonists and artists is like very niche. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a very specific focus, you know. And when I was making the books, people were like, "Oh, you should expand this to like office work and blah blah blah." And it's like, no, <laughs> I don't want to. Like, you know, the thing is, it can be. The book can be used by people who sit at a computer all day in an office, but my interest was artists, you know, specifically artists who like draw little boxes and draw inside those little boxes because the scale of the work is also smaller for the most part. So like if you're a muralist, my book is only going to go so far because, you know, it's like if you're waving your arm around with a paintbrush, you're going to end up with more ro- rotator cuff injuries than you are carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> so um, I think also one thing that Heidi was responding to was the specificity of the audience. Yeah. that is. I hadn't even thought about that. And But also I was thinking in terms of distribution and, and also things such as cost. Uh, university press books many times may have certain limitations when it comes to distribution and sometimes could be a little pricier than, let's say, a publisher such as Uncivilized would be able to put out. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think that's definitely a factor also um, because, you know, I want the book to be affordable. I want people to be able to buy a copy and keep it around and buy copies for their friends. <laughs> and um you know it's like i want it to be accessible and easy easy to get and not not a burden you know so yeah and derek you had mentioned the uh, kind of uncivilized books they're just kind of design sense and things like that i like the fact that this book is kind of small i could because i mean a lot of cartoonists uh go on like the convention circuit and stuff like that you could i could easily see people bringing this book with them because you've got uh, the, some uh, exercises and things to do, like kind of a uh, like exercise regimens that are spelled out in the book, also. Yeah, well, the size um, the size was my idea. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the quarter page size that I originally made was also very mindful um, because I wanted something that you could pick up. Now, the size of the current book can't quite be shoved in your hip pocket. But right. it's still handy. Like, I think it appeals to people to pick it up. 
you know, when I pick up larger books, I don't necessarily, I pick them up because I must in order to read them, but I don't <laughs> like want to handle them. If they're larger, they're more awkward, you know. Um, but I wanted something that people would like, like want to be, want to pick up essentially, or be interested in handling because of the size. Um, if that makes any sense, smaller yeah, things are, you know, smaller is cuter. It's and huggable. But yes, it's huggable. You can hug <laughs> your. You know, Criota, you said something a moment ago that you specifically wanted this book to be for cartoonists. And the subtitle of the book is Self Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists. But something else you mentioned is that, you know, people who sit at a desk, people who work in an office could benefit from this. You know, in reading through Draw Stronger, I'm not an artist. Um, but I do sit at a computer <laughs> a lot and, and type and deal with repetitive motions. But I couldn't help but think, you know, this book is applicable for audiences who aren't artists. And yes, you do target specifically to certain motions and activities that define what most cartoonists do. But it seemed to me that I could get a lot out of that, uh, given the kind of work that I do, and, and, and that many could. Um, had you thought – so I guess my question is, had you thought of, let's say maybe with something like a subtitle – broadening things a bit or were you very specific in that you wanted to speak to health posture self-care when it came to visual artists um i really kind of wanted to you know stick with the visual artist thing for me that was like a pretty broad <laughs> you know uh, a broader range than i had actually originally intended i mean yes i also i think that much, much, much of the book is like translatable uh, for writers and other people who are working pretty much exclusively on a computer with a keyboard. Um, if I had been writing it for uh, computer users more specifically, though, I actually would have put some um, put some other types of stretches and other explanations of how injuries might occur because the positioning and also ergonomics would have been different. Like in this, in the book now I talk about um, gripping a stylus and different ways to grip the stylus, mm -hmm. right? If I had made this also, you know, more for people using a keyboard, I would have like talked literally about hand placement on the keys and like, deviations of the hands and wrists that could be dangerous that way but yeah I'll, there's a lot there's a lot of um there's a lot of carryover i just there's something in my mind that just like gets you know it's like i pick a target <laughs> <laughs> and then i just like damn it i'm gonna like hit that target even though it would be very easy to veer off target and hit a bigger, like hit the barn, hit the side of the barn instead <laughs> of like the, the target taped up to it. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, transferable information and a lot of usefulness. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to stick with artists. So what can I say? <laughs> Yeah, and you mentioned the 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 earlier the the two earlier mini comics were again quarter page size, and this is a little larger than that. Yeah, uh, uh, and it looks I, I did a little co compare and contrast because I've got the earlier ones also. Uh, like I said, I've, I've got I've got the Creota my I have my Creota shelf, <laughs> and uh, and I I was looking at it and it looked like there had been there have been some revisions, if nothing else, kind of sort of re-lettering sometimes to open things up because the page is a little bigger. Can you talk about the kind of the revision process or and how you sutured the how you sutured the two books together? Right. So we combined no pain, uh, first aid, and then I was also working on the no back pain. So that's also in there. Um, and as and just in terms of the context in the context of the work that I had already done when I started talking to Tom about this, um, we added color to the artwork. And then once we agreed upon a size, I also went through and kind of resized things and started to play with the text and the arrangement of the text, um, which my husband, our Sikoriak ultimately had like the final say in terms of tweaking, which <laughs> really 
helped me a lot. Uh, but he's a real font guy and I'm just kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's writing. <laughs> it fits. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I also, the, the, uh, the lettering is a handwriting font. Um, I also redid the handwriting font to make it clearer. So there are some, uh, there are some sections that are done in the new font so that it's easier to read. Um, I, and then I added some pages to connect things a little bit more thoroughly or like flush things out where I felt there was a deficit. I also gave the book as I did with each mini, I would give the book to colleagues of mine. Um, in this case, um, a fellow massage therapist, Bill Rahner, uh, MK Cherwick, who was a nurse known as comic nurse mm -hmm. and, um, Greg Byers, who is a physical therapist that I know he's really an excellent physical therapist. And, uh, my personal trainer, Clenna Lampner. So I gave them the, you know, the PDF of the rough draft and I asked them to look through everything and then just give me any feedback. Um, so even though there are some references for people who are interested in reading further, a lot of the information is also just kind of um, standard practice at this point. So, um, you know, if people ask for a reference, it's like, well, I can give you like the names of a couple different orthopedic textbooks, <laughs> to an <laughs> book, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted some people like, you know, who are professionals in the area to like look at the material make sure that I was on target with, you know, what standard practices are now and to make sure it all made sense, you know, and um, what you might call like a clinical context. So mm -hmm. they did that. And um, happily, they did not actually have that many corrections <laughs> or suggestions <laughs> for me. So I was very happy. Um, although my friend Bill suggested some additional jokes, which I actually used a couple of. So that was good. Um, and uh, Greg and Glenna both, I think, gave me one or two additional exercises, which also appear. Um, but I was I was thrilled that uh, the feedback was actually pretty hands off. That I was like on the right track, and that um, they felt that I'd done a good job of communicating the information. So um, that made me very happy. And then. Um, we got the, we got everything kind of reconfigured and laid out. And then I real I decided I wanted to add more content. <laughs> <laughs> so I added pages on, um, Styloscript and, um, you know, how one uses the, your arm or your fingers or wrist to make lines like different lengths of lines require different um, joints. Yeah. I like. I like that. That part was really interesting because I hadn't really thought about that at all. Yeah. yeah. And what I always find interesting also is that people assume that the mid, the middle length lines are coming from the elbow because your elbow holds still in space and then your hand moves. Mm -hmm. But actually what is happening is that they're coming from the shoulder. So if you spend your time making mid range lines from that are you know from the shoulder and then long range lines which are also from the shoulder you can actually end up doing more damage to your shoulder than you would to your wrist or elbow so <laughs> <laughs> work anyway. small huh so work, work small yes yeah, so if you want if you want um finger tendonitis <laughs> or <carpal laughs> work small if you want shoulder tendonitis work large um hopefully you won't get either hopefully um, I, 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 was, I was gonna say i was happy that you mentioned the jokes uh because uh, uh if you haven't if for our listeners who haven't seen the book uh the way they're describing it sounds like it's a kind of a clinical textbook it's it it, it tells you a lot of information but it is also funny there are jokes laden all the way through it right yes uh, and i noticed <laughs> i noticed even on the uh on the publication page uh, complaints regarding my sense of humor should be directed to Arnold Roth, whose crazy book of science has been my companion since my 12th birthday. 
Can you talk a little bit about the use of humor in your work and where and and especially, I guess, particularly what Roth, uh, what would you took away from Roth? Yeah, I was given Arnold Roth's Crazy Book of Science for my 12th birthday. Um, and it has it has moved with me ever since. Um, and I just I responded to his drawing style, but also his um, ability to make jokes about science that are actually relevant to the concepts that he's explaining. He's not really trying to teach you anything, but like he is stating principles of science and he sees an opportunity to make a joke and he does it. And it's (laughs) funny. And, you know, there's one that has never left me. I don't know what page it's on. I'm not that good with the (laughs) book, but um, it's a series of panels with one word per panel that says sound travels slower in cold air. And then there's a guy, like, getting ready to put a nail into a board and another man walking past him. So as the guy is walking past, the guy with the board hits the nail and hits his thumb and yells, ouch. But by the time the guy walking past him hears it, he's already driving a new nail in, so into the board. (laughs) So the ouch like takes so much time to catch up with, with the walking man that he turns around and he's heard this ouch and he just sees a guy driving a hammer into a nail. It and makes no sense. Huh? To him. So it makes no sense to him. It's no sense to him. And for some reason, I just thought that was incredibly funny. Um, and I still think it's incredibly funny. And now I think it's also incredibly smart because it actually really I mean, obviously, sound is not is not delayed that long, <laughs> weather. But you know, it actually really de- it it enforces that principle and idea in a very memorable and remarkable way. Um, so I and I've been teaching um, as a massage therapist. I've been teaching. I've taught on and off for over twenty five years now. Um, and for a long while, I was teaching a pathology class for massage therapists that went from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. <laughs> um, and then also it was for four hours on a Saturday. So it's like I would have these poor students in my class who would just be trying to do everything not to fall asleep. Like, you know, I'd get them to stand up and stand in the back of the room. But the other thing I would do is like, I would just start cracking jokes about disease as I was trying to convince <laughs> people. And so, you know, humor and humor and teaching have kind of like always been a part of what I do. Um, I also feel like dumb humor is a great way to kind of um, trick people into not putting up resistance to what you have to tell them. Because like, we all know how well uh, we respond to people just telling us what we have to do or have to know or have to learn. <laughs> that works yeah. so well. um, And I kind of use, you know, a reviewer described the humor in the book as dad jokes. <laughs> and, and Ouch. <laughs> he's right. No, but he's right because I really I try to make this the humor kind of dumb or punny or something because then you know the reader is like, oh well, this person may know about anatomy, but they don't know anything about like funny. You know, <laughs> this is kind of stupid. <laughs> but what it does is it also makes the reader an expert somewhere. Right. So the reader is an expert. Like they know what funny is. And obviously I do not know what funny is. <laughs> I mean this. And so it like gives us some more even footing. So also the characters in the book, you know, it's like they all have their moments. I really tried to make sure that everybody was like kind of dumb sometimes and then kind of smart sometimes. So that, yeah. you know, there's usually someone in there who's like doing something that is not healthy and then someone else kind of pointing that out to them. Um, But 
everybody gets to rotate through that. And, and I think that that kind of like, uh, making the characters vulnerable or making the storyline vulnerable to criticism about something like, I think it actually makes it more inviting in a certain way. And I feel like humor, part of humor is that like giving, giving text a certain amount of vulnerability mm-hmm. uh, or some other kind of invitation. So it's not just like giving you facts and telling you what's going to happen to you. You know, it's like, it's kind of inviting you to like explore these ideas, think about them in slightly different ways and then um, come to your own conclusions. Yeah, Although and it, make, it makes it more memorable too. Yeah. It, and also it makes it more personable, uh, the humor. And then along with that, another strategy that you use throughout Draw Stronger is that this is the way that I look at it. Uh, you have a cast of characters of about what, four or five individuals and you keep reusing them over and over again, the same cartoonists, the same artists, and we get to see them in the various sections of your book, the, the three main parts, basics, exercises, and first aid. You know, sometimes one comes across as knowledgeable, sometimes one comes across as not so knowledgeable, sometimes one is more serious at another time that same person tells one of these dad jokes that you mentioned. And so even though we don't know who these people are, in other words, we don't know their names, we don't know much about them other than they probably should take better care of themselves when they draw. (laughs) um, We get to know them to a point. And so I think that along with the humor does add a more personal touch to subject matter that you're right, may come across to, to some as potentially dry. Yeah, good. I'm glad because that's, you know, that's really what I'm aiming for. It's, you know, um, yeah, it can be, I mean, I'm really interested in this stuff, but for a lot of people, it can be really boring. (laughs) And at the same time, if you're going to be a career artist um, or even just like a long term chronic hobbyist, you really need to be aware of the potential for injury when you're, you know, when you're drawing. So um, even if you're not interested in this stuff, you still kind of have to know about it. Um, And so that was a real, um, that was a priority with me to try and, to try and kind of capture the audience who like is reading the book because they know they're supposed to. (laughs) (laughs) Um, because the other people I'm not worried about, like the people who are really into it, it's like, I could just, you know, I could really lay it out in the most boring way possible. And as long as the information was still useful, they would be okay with that to a certain extent. You know what I mean? But I'm like, you know, it's like, I'm really trying to also make this for people who, you know, are not, who understand the necessity, but are not really interested like taxes or, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what else i don't know nutrition <laughs> it's like for me i hate nutrition nutrition is the worst thing but i understand that i cannot live on beer and ice cream even though i would what? prefer to yes you're kidding <laughs> this just in um <laughs> gotta rethink my life choices <laughs> yeah so you know it's like i do some reading and studying up on nutrition and like food choices but it's really not what i want to be spending my time doing um, but I do it because I ultimately know that beer and ice cream is not the way I should be living my life, although I want to be. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, to switch gears for a second, uh, in our email conversations leading up to this interview, you had mentioned that you recently completed a certificate in bioethics. And you had this sentence in your email. You said, uh, studying bioethics, uh, I, th- I think studying bioethics is going to make me a better cartoonist. Yeah, And I was like, what does that mean? Bioethics makes you a better cartoonist? So what that means is that um, I, for fun, <laughs> I, make, <laughs> you know, like, I, I make comics about, you know, health and disease and, um, and various states within that. Mm-hmm. Um, and bioethics is, so ethics is a... Um, part of philosophy that, you know, is about like behaviors um, and 
you could even talk about right behaviors and wrong behaviors, although most ethicists would like kind of disagree with that idea also, because there's a whole continuum Mm -hmm. of conduct and behaviors and different rationale for different ways to behave. So ethics is a part of philosophy and bioethics is ethics concerned with health and the body and medicine. And, um, Topics that are relevant in bioethics are usually like the big icky ones that are like very um, dramatic, right? So reproductive rights is an entirely, you know, it's entirely a bioethical issue, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, genetics. That's another big one. Uh, End of life issues, Um, you know, also there are as a massage therapist, also um, there are, Uh, the concept of paternalism where the practitioner doesn't really tell the patient what they're doing. They just do it because it's the best thing for the patient. Like, you know, practitioner knows best. Top down Um, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that, and that is, um, and standardized medicine is criticized for that a lot. Patients don't feel like they understand like the rationale behind the treatments that they're encouraged to undergo, you know, so there's a lot of friction and discourse around paternalism in established medical settings, but I actually find a lot of paternalism in um, integrative healthcare, alternative healthcare, um, where on a certain level, the stakes are lower because I'm a massage therapist. I'm not curing your cancer. (laughs) I'm treating your (laughs) tinnitus. Um, But at the same time, I, you know, I know a number of practitioners who, you know, the patient's like, well, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And the person is like, well, don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing. This is going to (laughs) work. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, this is the same issue we have. Anyway, yeah, enough about massage therapy. But, you know, it's like um, these, you know, studying for a school year. Um, the different reactions that patients can have to illness, the different types of concerns that they have, and then also discussing the rationale and desire for different actions in the face of these questions, um, I think is making my comics more interesting. I'm working on something right now that I'm not quite ready to talk about. Um, but it's very loaded. Um, it's about it's about medicine and his, the history of medicine and institutional racism. And wow. even yeah, even just by saying that, I can feel like I can already feel people ears <laughs> pricking up. Um, don't worry, I'm going to be consulting <laughs> a lot of people about this and, I'll <laughs> and put it out there. <laughs> If anything, if bioethics has taught me anything, like getting feedback from others is like very valuable. Um, But I would never have felt as confident exploring these areas um, as I do. And when I say confident, it's still, there's still a certain amount of trepidation because like I'm going into some very like risky territory. But at the same time, I feel like I'm uh, as like, finding a voice to discuss these issues in is a little bit easier now because I've been trained to consider who has a stake in these issues and what kind of stake I have in these issues and where, where in these issues I have authority and where I do not have authority. And I think that that's actually one of the most important things. There are certain places where, I don't have authority. Like I don't know. And I can never know because of who I am. You know, it's like because of my race, because of my gender, because of my economic status, all of these things. And having studied bioethics, it's like, it's actually easier for me to evaluate that and also accept it. (laughs) I think the acceptance part was actually very tricky for a while, but like now I'm starting to, so ultimately I think this will make me a better cartoonist, you know, plus I'm still making gag cartoons about end of life issues and do not resuscitate. And you know, it's like, those are stupid and silly. Um, but the other stuff is like more loaded. And I really think, um, the bioethics 
the bioethics training is going to, um, it's just going to make the work better. It's going to make a better story. It's going to make for better drama. And I think it will also give me a way, again, not to tell my readers anything, but to try and get them to explore issues with me. And I think, you know, and again, that's very important because we all know how well telling people what they think should think works. <laughs> so. You know, Kriota, what you've what you've just said reminds me that, um, you know, Gene mentioned that he's known of your work for a few years now. Um, I have to say, though, that I didn't come across anything of yours until, curiously enough, maybe two weeks before Gene suggested that we bring you on the podcast uh, around the time of the publication of Draw Stronger. And I was um, – actually, I was getting ready to interview another guest for the podcast, uh, Hazel Nulevant. So I was reading their comics for choice that they helped to – co-edit. And lo and behold, I came across your body and soul, science and religion. And so when Gene mentioned your name and that you had a new book coming out, I thought, wait a minute now, that name sounds familiar. And I went back through and saw that this was indeed the same person. And I, I really appreciate this. I think it's a six pager, body and soul, science and religion. The entire collection, for those listeners who may not uh, know, who haven't <laughs> listened to my interview with Nulevent from several weeks ago, it is a variety of comics by different creators about the issue of choice and abortion in one form or another. And, Creota, what you do in your comic is you give, in many ways, kind of a condensed history is one way of looking at this, of how – fertilization, science, religion, personhood, quickening, all of that stuff uh, has been viewed at different times in our history. Yeah. And actually it was, I was, <laughs> I was uh, in the bioethics course at Montefiore Einstein when I was making that. This particular comic? Yeah. So one another another like great lesson from the bioethics course was that i i have really accepted that sometimes patients will make choices that i think are absolutely the wrong choices and they are absolutely the right choice for that patient like and as a practitioner you also have you know it's like if the patient if you're going to actually give the patient autonomy <laughs> <laughs> you have to ex you have to respect it when they exercise it in a way that you don't necessarily agree with. You know, it's like if they're being true to their values, then they are going to want certain things that you may not want. And so for me with this piece, I wanted to I wanted to find a way to combine kind of like this science of fetal development, Hazel and Wit. Taylor asked me if I would do something about fetal development for the book because most of the stories are uh, personal narratives. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted something that was a little bit more, uh, I don't know, clinical or anatomical, you know, something that was a little more like graphic in terms of like the development of the embryo and the fetus. Right. And, um, and those those images, right, um, can be seen in a number of different ways. Um, and I, what I wanted to do was kind of like combine combine, you know, the clinical um, fetal development chart, also with the acknowledgement that different religions and disciplines equate ensoulment of the fetus, ensoulment is a big word that I learned in bioethics school, equate ensoulment of the fetus with different, different states of fetal development. So some of them advocate that ensoulment happens at the moment of conception, and then some of them actually don't, don't really view um, the fetus as having a soul until essentially it's born, right? And then there are different degrees within there. And I think I also talk about Aristotle, like 
saying that a male a male fetus will have a soul at 40 days and a female gets a soul at 80 or 90 days i can't remember <laughs> <laughs> so it's like and you can't even tell you can't really tell what the sex of a fetus is and when i say sex i mean it clinically i'm not talking gender i'm talking about the odds of this fetus either like squirting out testosterone or estrogen when it hits mm -hmm. puberty that's what i'm mean by sex right so you know, it's like you can't even tell whether the, the sex of the fetus is going to be male or female at 40 days, but somehow the soul knows. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in it's in the male fetus, but not the female fetus, um, which I just found highly amusing. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to kind of combine these, you know, combine these different aspects of development um, you know, in the same kind of chart. And then of course the fetuses make comments and um, there is also some, there is some history in there um, about um, the history of uh, pregnancy termination in the United States and how that was viewed up to a certain period of time. Um, and, you know, it was a lot of fun to do and I learned a lot. Um, and I found, <laughs> I found some conflicting information which is kind of interesting to me in terms of fetal development from like uh, respected sources. So I ultimately sent some, I, I asked a friend of mine who teaches uh, sex ed in high school out <laughs> <laughs> of a couple of different places. Like she was my, she was my objective resource for a couple, a couple of issues I was having with the, with the drawings. But um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was really interesting. And again, I wanted to, I wanted to make a piece where people could read it, enjoy it, hopefully learn something and then arrive at their own conclusions. And whatever they decide is, has to be fine with me. Like I want it to be fine with me. And I want them to like, kind of understand from the tone of the information that whatever they decide is fine with me and that's that bioethics coming in again yes i i can't help it it's like it's it's <laughs> totally it's totally like kind of becoming a part of me which i think is really interesting you know the other thing that was interesting to me was that for most of the information that i found on fetal ensoulment i went um to um the NIH.gov National National Institute of Health and mm -hmm. would search through uh, medical papers because um, different physicians from different cultures would actually talk about the history of their culture and periods of insultment. Wow. So, you know, it's like I would, um, I found some, you know, like, published medical papers from doctors who were Muslim who were talking about periods of ensoulment or doctors who were Jewish who were talking about periods of ensoulment or doctors who were Hindu, you know? So it's like, there's actually this information like within the medical literature. And I found, I found that really, really interesting. <laughs> and wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't expect that at all. No, I, and I didn't either, but there it was. So that was really fun for me. Your contribution to the the anthology Comics for Choice stands out in you know some of the ways that you mentioned you know whereas the vast majority of the contributions are mostly I guess personal narratives um, mm -hmm. also almost all of the other pieces come out with a more overt position which is understandable given the nature of the subject matter of this collection. Right. Your piece, on the other hand, is – now, you described it as kind of clinical. I think that's one way of, of uh, kind of encapsulating it. But also, it is medical in the sense that you do provide information without any kind of conclusion or definitely with no judgment. And so – it's it's almost as if a doctor is giving you the information and letting the patient decide what what is best for you. Yeah, I will – 
Yeah, other than my not being a doctor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, you know, that's one of the things that uh, I appreciated about uh, Draw Stronger is you say at the outset, and you mentioned this later on in the book, but you do say that, you know, you're not a medical professional, you know, you're a massage therapist, you have some experience with this stuff, but when it comes to serious questions and even problems, medical issues, then you should consult your health professional. And so, I mean, you are very clear about that in the new book. Yeah, yeah. I am, um, you know, being, so being in what's now becoming integrative medicine, but used to be called alternative medicine, there are, I've uh, met um, and, you know, had experiences with a number of people who um, have looked to massage, acupuncture, herbs, um, energy work, and other types of things as um, the way to not receive what would be considered like established medical treatment, institutional medicine. Um, and that, and for some people, that has literally cost them their lives. So... <laughs> I um I am I am a real believer in people making their own decisions once they have all the facts. So, you know, if you have a pain in your shoulder and I am treating it and I can't get you improvement within say 3 or 4 treatments, then I think it's time to like kick you higher up the food chain. You know, it's like you need, to go, you need to go get a diagnosis. I don't diagnose. Like I can make some educated guesses and I can treat your muscles, but, you know, or your tendons or whatever. But I, you know, it's like a lot of my guesses are pain by location. And then I know some orthopedic tests, you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I can't diagnose that tumor. <laughs> and, <laughs> And obviously, if I feel a lump, I'm going to say, I'm not massaging this, go, you know, take it somewhere else. But, you know, I do know some people who tried to treat their pain with chiropractic, massage, acupuncture, and other things for years, um, or at least a year, until the pain got so great that they ended up in an emergency room, and then guess what? It was cancer. Um, and that that is not good. So. If you, you know, if something's going wrong, I think you need to find out what it is. There's nothing that requires, and I'm not saying it's always going to be cancer. You know, it's like, <laughs> it could be, you know, it could be a tendonitis that just behaves in a weird way that I've, you know, I haven't encountered before. Or it could be that, you know, you like tore a piece of cartilage or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It could be a lot of stuff, arthritis, whatever. Um but all of that stuff is also treated in very different ways, right? Massage can't treat everything. And so you really need to know what you're treating in order to treat it effectively. And if you decide you don't want to take the treatment your doctor recommends, that's fine. As long as you know exactly what you've got, I'll defend your right to like, you know, not do the treatment that they want. As long as it's a really informed and thought out decision. Um, so yeah, I, I joke with my students. I also teach dancers cause I used to be a dancer and I'll joke with them often and just say, I'll totally defend your right to get injured as long as you do it mindfully. <laughs> <laughs> so if you read, if you read draw stronger and you've got some deadline and you know, you're just like heading, you know, it's like, you know, you've just thrown yourself off the 50th floor and you're heading for the pavement, but you don't feel like you have a choice. As long as you're taking breaks <laughs> as you're falling through the air, you know, and like doing your stretches and doing everything else. For one thing, you'll probably lessen the degree of discomfort that you have or the degree of pain that you have. But also, like, I support that choice. If you're like, I know this is going to happen. I know I've got to do this. I choose to do it anyway. I'm like, okay, good for you. Like, you know, I totally support that. Then you have to really take care of yourself afterwards to, um, to kind of like heal from that experience. But I, 
I don't have any problem with that. I don't have a problem with people like taking risks, you know, or maybe somehow they like hit the deadline and they're just a little stiff the next day and that's it. It's like, great. (laughs) I was totally wrong. I like that even better. Right. Um, But I, you know, as long as people like have facts and want to make informed decisions and the, and don't insist that anybody else make the same decision they made, then I'm pretty okay with it. But like cycling back to comics for choice, for me, it's like, I don't want to insist that anybody make, I don't want anyone insisting that I make reproductive health decisions based on what they think is right and wrong. And I don't want to imply to anybody that they should make the same choices that I have made because my way is the only way. It's like, that's not, I don't think that's true. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying, like, that's like, I really, I really want people to be able to support each other, even if we're not making the same decisions in our healthcare or the path of our health, you know, as long as everybody's like working from like good reliable information i think we should all support each other in our in our path and in our choices you know and not not imply that we should be making other choices because that's what i did you know right but just get the information first before you yeah make that decision yeah and then say i love you no matter what you do you know yeah. pretty, well pretty much i love you no matter yeah. what <laughs> You know, um, so, so that, uh, so that people, you know, yeah, so that people just feel a little more confident in, or less defensive. They may be confident, but for, so people have, feel less defensive in the choices they make to keep themselves healthy, you know, or to live their lives. If not keep, they may choose not to keep themselves healthy, healthy, and that should be fine too. I want to come back to to draw stronger uh, where we first started, and you know one of the the things that I'd observed earlier was your cast of characters, where we keep coming back to them to the point that I mean we don't know who they are, but it's almost as if we get to know them throughout the course of the book. Now, there's another figure we haven't even talked about yet, and I'm curious <laughs> about, and this is the little pain symbol yeah. Yeah. Th- that you have animated. And I'm curious, does that figure have a name? Because I couldn't find one in the text. And if he doesn't, had you considered giving him a name? Um, It's just pain. Just pain. So pain. he's not like a painy or pain boy or anything like that? No, no. <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting is I think of him as male and you think of him as male, but I don't think I've given him and i'm making little air quotes around (laughs) any (laughs) any you know any uh, markers of maleness i just (laughs) other than it's lightning i don't know it's like i don't know but um but yeah like i also think of it as a male character for whatever reason well he or it has what looks like heavy eyebrows. And so right. that, that seems to be more masculine and feminine. I mean, the closest thing I could, I mean, if this is female pain, it, it, I don't know. It looks kind of like, uh, the wicked witch from the wizard of Oz in a way. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the, I, the eyebrows themselves are also lightning bolts. So they do create a heavier yeah. brow for sure. Um, I, so Bob, our Sikoriak, my husband and I, um, obviously have been talking about the book as I've been making it. And I don't remember if he suggested I make pain a character or if I talked about making pain a character, but, um, there are, you know, a lot of comics have mascots. A lot of comics have mascots. A lot of educational comics have mascots, you know, it's like, um, and, and mascots like, uh, help ease us through story or, you know, they lead us through little terrain, you know, like dangerous terrain or whatever. They like provide some kind of consistency. And they're also, they're also like the foil, I guess. I was like, just going to say foil. 
Yeah, I needed a foil, right? So the cartoonists in the book, the artists in the book, sometimes they're smart, sometimes they're not so smart, but they're never like the bad guy. <laughs> and I felt like I needed a bad guy um, for, you know, drama, for drama in an educational <laughs> comic. But, but um, you, also, you also call pain a frenemy because frenemy. the pain lets you know that something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Pain is important. And that's, you know, masking pain is um, useful in certain contexts and then dangerous in other contexts. That was a big that that was one of my big takeaways from the book, actually. Yeah. That yeah. Just masking pain is that, that's that's not a cure at all. It's just a temporary. Yeah, it, it temporarily fixes it. It masks it, but it doesn't cure it. And so and um. Yeah, and I feel like that's actually a big misconception. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of confusion between like curing something and then just like hiding a symptom. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that definitely had to go in there. But you know, it's like I'm also, um, I'm also just kind of interested passively at this point, but maybe it will become active later. Um, I'm interested in how people how people render pain visually, uh, especially from the graphic medicine perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, with a lot of patient narratives, there are different ways that people, you know, draw their pain um, or draw their symptoms. You know, how do you draw nausea, dizziness? <laughs> <laughs> how do you draw subjective symptoms? You know, vomiting is an objective, like that's a sign. Right. But is a symptom. So like, how do we, how do we communicate symptoms that have no objective measure? You know, that you can't go to the doctor's office and the doctor can say, oh, I observe you have pain by the lightning bolt coming out of your shoulder. <laughs> like, you know, we don't have that. There are clues, but we have to rely on the patient to actually tell us whether or not they are in pain. And then also to tell us the degree of pain that they're in. So the face scale or something like that? Yeah. They're they're so in the book I actually give some different pain scales, like the Wong the Wong Baker like face analogs, uh, the zero to ten scale and the mild, moderate, severe scale are all scales that are actually used. And then I made a drawing scale, which is not really <laughs> used. but but it does give a sense of function. Like you could actually use it. You could think about your pain in terms of I'm in pain, but I can draw or, you know, I'm in pain, but it's a little irritating. I'm in pain. I can still draw, but it hurts. And, you know, it's like I'm in pain. I can barely draw and then I can't draw at all. Like there are different levels of function and association with pain, but I'm, I, I am really interested in the way artists, um, um, draw symptoms. And so there's this one cartoonist Crookshank. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um his he drew medical cartoons. When was he drawing in the 17 18th wait, century? I can't yeah. remember. Yeah, oh, that's embarrassing that I can't remember when he was active. Um England, right? Eight, UK. Yeah. 18, early 1800s or late 1700s? Mm -hmm. I think, I think um, mid mid to late 1800s. Oh, okay. If I'm not cool. mistaken. I could be wrong. Thought. Anyway, he so he renders pain as little like demons, and they're either like colored black or colored blue, and they usually have little wings, like they look like little devils in a way. Sometimes they have pitchforks or they have ropes or you know they have hammers. They usually have an implement or they're biting, you know, but they're essentially little pain spirits, you know, and they're they're a visual representation of the infliction of pain onto a body. So it gives you a better sense of the experience of the pain because they have a different tool depending <laughs> upon what type of pain the person has. Um, and he's just he's he's an example I like because he's really funny. Um, but, you know, it's like different cultures have different different like types of visual reference for pain. And so I was just, I was just thinking, you know, okay, what am I going to do? Um, and one type, the type of pain um, 
will sometimes indicate what type of tissue is damaged. Uh, and so lightning-like pain usually indicates uh, nerve damage. Um, and lightning is like a very easy visual metaphor, <laughs> much better than <laughs> diffuse pain or heat, you know, so... Um, so lightning, so lightning it became. So essentially the pain, the little pain mascot um, is probably the result of a nerve impingement. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I used, think you got, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, technically you'd have to say he's the result of nerve impingement, but I just use him to indicate any pain in the book. So all <laughs> sorts of pain. I, I could see like he could be he could be merchandisable. You could make like wrist braces with pain on it and Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pain a little pain t shirt. I was thinking about making yeah. t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like the merchandising idea. Yeah. One of my one of my friends, uh Dynamo, uh, who is on Twitter, she tweeted um I think she designed or drew up like a lightning bolt pain plushie toy for me and tweeted it. Um Oh like nice. She, she came up with some merch that was pretty fun. <laughs> I should, should get her to dig those up for me and like seriously consider them. <laughs> You're like uh, the huggable pain, the, the, the huggable the, pain, the pain, the pain pillow. Yes, yes. Yeah. R r r uh, elevate your elevate your swollen foot with this pain pillow. <laughs> <laughs> now, Creato, you had mentioned earlier that there's something that you're currently working on that you're, you're really not at a point where you can talk much about it. Is there anything that your other things that you're currently working on that maybe you can share with us? Sure. Um, the thing I can't talk about right now, it will be ultimately will be a thing in itself, but it will ultimately go into a larger collection. I was the artist in residence at the New York Academy of Medicine historical collection last year. And yeah, I was, I'm glad you mentioned it. I was about, I was going to ask that, but go for it. Yeah. So, so I wanted to research something that would give me an excuse to make comics in needlework <laughs> so what better than the history of sutures and ligatures so <laughs> so i spent i spent nine months um with the collection um with the incredible staff there they were so much fun i miss them all I, I was really welcome there they gave me a desk i got the same access to the collection that um the fellows, the research fellows do. Um, the librarian, Arlene Shainer, uh, was just, in, she's so knowledgeable. Anyway, it was just a really great experience. Um, and I'm ultimately hoping to assemble a graphic novel that explores the history of sutures and ligatures, um, probably from... Oh, the time of Galen up to the time of Lister. So Galen is like second century AD, I think, up to Lister, who is like uh, 1800s, mid 1800s. Um, and also simultaneously with that, I'm interested in looking into um, the history of the of the production of the textiles that um, made the suture materials and um, you can't do a history of sewing without also like looking at gender roles in sewing to a certain extent in history. So, well, mm -hmm. you could, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. So this is this is a hugely like crazy ambitious thing. It's not going to be an educational assemblage. Um, it'll be a collection that hopefully will be a graphic novel that will be partially rendered in embroidery. Um, I will also be doing a number of like comics that will be funny. I did one uh, mini comic that I've put out called stitch in time, which is Galen and Celsus stitching up a gladiator together. I love that one. <laughs> Um, and these two men never didn't live at the same time. Celsus lived like 
at least a century, maybe two centuries before Galen did. But Celsus was an encyclopedist who wrote about um, um, sutures and surgery and ligatures. And then Galen, very famous surgeon, um, uh, second only to Hippocrates, uh, according to this other um, historical surgeon, Ambrose Paré, um, Galen was a big kind of like huge showboaty kind of surgeon and doctor. Um, and I decided to put the two of them together to kind of like contrast Galen's personality with someone who I have no idea what kind of personality Celsus had. But anyway, they stitch up a, they stitch up a gladiator together using flax as opposed to wool or silk or, you know, whatever else might be sinews, other things that might be lying around. Um, but, you know, making comics about parts of my research also help me process the research and find opportunities for humor, but also like allow me to ask questions about the work. So visually you should not use any of it as historically accurate, <laughs> but medically you can use it as accurate and there's commentary on the different panels and also um, citations and a reference list in the back. Um, yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got a copy in, right in front of me right now that, that I picked up at Chicago Comics. Uh, uh, Kaching. Uh, I love little, Chicago Comics. Yeah, and uh, it's a it's it's a mini comic. So the story itself is twelve pages. Each page is a single panel. Yeah, and then after the after those twelve panels, we've got three pages of uh, discursive notes. And yeah. I, I love your I love it because you you kind of annotate every single panel, and there's a mixture of. Uh, kind of a your own humor but also where you got this information from what the competing theories are that you've chose one over the other for some of your interpretations and so the notes are really just as much fun as the, as the story itself and again we got a we got a nice work cited page there too yeah good yeah i i really i wanted to you know reading reading footnotes and citations should be interesting. And sometimes it really is like even, even in academic papers, if the author is like really engaged and they're not too caught up in language, they can like make some really fun and engaging footnotes that are still, you know, totally right on point. But I, but a lot of footnotes and um, remarks about work can be very dry and I didn't want to do that. So like I make some, yeah, some of it's dad humor, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I make I make commentary. You know, it's like there's one panel where Galen licks the flax the flax to stiffen it before mm -hmm. he shoves it through the needle, um, and that is actually perfectly possible. <laughs> you know, like we would we would cringe at that. Like now, if a surgeon actually like licked the silk to stiffen it, and, like put it through a needle before he stitched up a patient, we would just all freak <laughs> out. Um, with good reason. But you know, in Galen's time, like bacteria didn't exist. You know, like pus, pus was um, a sign of like infection, but pus was also seen in a different light. There was like good pus and bad pus, laudable pus and not. <laughs> Pus, which and that got like kind of twisted and turned into something else in Europe, you know, later centuries later. But you know, Galen very well could have like been licking his flax before he shoved it through the eye of that needle. <laughs> you know, Criota, I have to say that licking that flax and good pus and bad pus that's the first time <laughs> that any of these phrases have been mentioned on the comics alternative. So, congratulations! <laughs> good pus, you bad pus. <laughs> oh, you should see my Twitter feeds and my Facebook feeds. Everybody's like, oh, I found this, like, pussy wound, dissected oh, yeah. dog, you know, whatever, <laughs> uterus, crocheted uterus. Like, and I thought of you, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is just adorable. <laughs> um, so, yeah, <laughs> this kind of stuff. My, my husband has a strong stomach because I'll... <laughs> You know, guess what I read today, honey, you know, and then <laughs> over dinner, I'll like start talking about it. So your your new book, Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists, came out last month. 
uh, yes. for Mocha Fest. So our listeners, whether they are visual artists or not, I think could benefit from this so they can run out and get it right now. Yes, they can. They can run out. And also Barnes & Noble is carrying it as well. They can go to Amazon. They can go to Uncivilized Books. Uh, some Barnes & Noble stores have it in stores. And fine comics shops everywhere, or almost everywhere, also carry it. So you can the fine ones will. The fine ones, yeah. yeah. The fine ones. Well, Creator, thank you very much for coming on the show. We had a great time talking with you. And good luck with this new book. Well, thank you so much. This is a lot of fun. I'm, I'm glad. I'm very glad. I'm, I, this this was this was tons of fun. I, I, I again, you 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 your your interest goes so many places, and it all comes through in your work, and it's really a joy to read. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that was a lot of fun, Derek. I've been I've been wanting to talk to her for a while, but uh, we didn't really have a a book that uh, people would be able to find easily enough. So I'm very glad that uh, Uncivilized picked up Draw Stronger: Self Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists. Yes, I really enjoyed that, and I'm glad that uh, you you drew my attention to it because I wasn't aware of her work before you'd mentioned Draw Stronger, a except for that one piece that I'd mentioned in Comics for Choice. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that would have stood out had you not mentioned her upcoming book at the time, Draw Stronger. Yeah, and it's a, it's a it's a really fascinating book, and again, she's a fascinating person just to talk to and to and to listen to all the different things that she's got to say. Mm -hmm. And if you want to find great books like this, then you better head over to the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service, because they have a wide variety of comics for every kind of reader, and more importantly, at great discounts. That's DCBService.com. We love discounts. That's right. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about our conversation with Creota. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 4153266427. And if you talk with your hands, you can type out your questions or comments to us. Uh, or our email address is two guys. That's T W O guys at comicsalternative.com. My email address is Gene with a G at comicsalternative.com. And Derek? I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to the website, comicsalternative.com. We're all over your computer and or mobile device. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> There's no escaping the comics alternative. That's right. So share that news with your friends. Exactly. Yeah. And we're going to have more great shows like what you just heard that we'll be publishing in the days to come. So be sure to check back for those. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Gene. Take care. Bye-bye.